KWT slaying. Salama family, Salama, how y'all doing today? Hope you're blessed and highly favored on this Shabbat. Hope you have a blessed day today. So before I get started, I want to read something to you. Someone posted uh, in our Tail Ministry Live on Facebook. It's interesting, okay? This is a dream that an 11-year-old kid had. He's in sixth grade. I don't know if they watch Tail Ministries or if they watch something else, but it's interesting. So it says, an 11-year-old told me his dream. He said, y'all said we are leaving soon. He was not given specifics. He said it could be around a war in America. He said he was high in the sky and was able to see all the continents. People were on ships. He said it was a lot of people, maybe millions. He said he knew Yah, his words was with him because nobody got seasick. He saw black people, but a little white people too. He said the ships took them to Africa. After they got to Africa, they got off and started walking. Later, he told me he had a scripture. I asked, what, what goes with the dream? Oh, that goes with the dream. He said, yes, I said, what made you look for a scripture? He said he felt Yah was telling him to look. Now, this, this scripture made it real interesting for me because as far as I know, Tail Ministry is the only one that taught on this. All right. The scripture is Jeremiah 29, 14. And I will be found of you, said Yahuwah, and I will turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, said Yahuwah. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Now, that's the dream. Eat the meat, spit out the bones. I hope it's true. Uh, you know, apparently, you know, this kid, all he do is play games and study and stuff like that. So uh, someone shared that with us. Thought I'd, you know, share that with you all. And hopefully we out of here soon. I pray we are. All right. So today we're going to talk about history. Now, what I find, you know, what I like the most about history is uh, the fact that, you know, when you're teaching true history, everything starts to line up, right? You can knock down the dominoes and all the pieces fall together because everything is true. You know, you don't have to defend the truth. I noticed with Gentiles, Gentiles are very good at gaslighting, right? I had one particular Gentile commenting under my videos, wanted my opinion on us being, you know, on who the bride is and all this stuff. And I knew where he was going with it. Right. So I pointed him to a link to one of my articles and the video. And he like, oh, you don't want to uh, answer the question I see. Right? I'm like, dude, I got a whole study on it. Why you want me to refer to one particular verse? like you do, right? Like you Gentiles do. Y'all take one little verse and you take it out of context and you apply it to yourselves or you apply it to the chat. So I told him, I said, look, you keep it up, I'm gonna block you. So, you know, he got blocked because you know how the Gentiles are. They good for gaslighting. They don't want no truth or they want to have truth. They want it to fit their paradigm. But you know me, I told you this is a truth ministry. So I, I ain't got a problem telling you the truth. I ain't got a problem blocking people either. You know, but what I'm going to do today, fair use, fair use. 
Shout out to my brother, Dante Fortson. I'm going to share a, a part of a teaching from Dante. Why? Because it adds to what we're going to talk about today, right? And it's not going to be a long teaching. Uh, hopefully it's not. I mean, I don't think it's going to be long, but uh, let me share this. So this is from Dante's, one of his recent uh, videos. All right. In here, uh, this is starting from page 65. The bottom page 65 to 66. Now, remember, some of these people converted. Those are the new Christians. They have converted. And remember, they thought the kids died in Sao Tome. And I told you other sources say they didn't. So I'm going to read this right here. From Lorenzo Tramajo to Cardinal Francesco Barberini, Lisbon. This is in Portugal. 14th of February, 1632. So this is, what, 13 years after the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. It says, after the expulsion of the Jews from Portugal in 1495, which is what we just covered, and the continued persecution of new Christians, those are the converts, the conversos, the new Christians, which culminated in the Lisbon massacres of 1506. We'll read about that in a minute from Hannah Adams, which she wrote in 1818 about this. Many Jews and new Christians left for Morocco. This is going to be important. All right, one more time. After the expulsion of Jews from Portugal in 1495 and the continued persecution of new Christians, which culminated in the Lisbon massacres of 1506, many Jews and new Christians left for Morocco and also for West Africa. One more time. After the expulsion from, of Jews from Portugal in 1495 and the continued persecution of new Christians, which culminated in the Lisbon massacres of 1506, many Jews and new Christians left for Morocco and also for West Africa. In the West African trading stations, Jewish rites could be practiced with little disturbance from the ecclesiastical authorities by the early 17th century, the 1600s, new Christian influence in Western Africa was widespread and flourished alongside other kinds of relig religious heterodoxy. This is right before the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. If they say that the transatlantic slave trade started in 1619, this document right here, which is published by Cambridge University in 2010, Cambridge University Press, is saying that in the early 17th century or 1600s, new Christian influence, that's converted Jews in West Africa, was widespread and flourished alongside other kinds of religious heterodoxy. So one of the things I want you to take particular note from what Dante was saying was that uh, many of the Jews were, were in Morocco, right? And so a, a lot of this uh, goes back and tied to um, the things we've talked about in the past about what happened in Portugal and Spain and Sao Tome and being scattered amongst the world as slaves, right? And, but here's the other thing, right? We got to note that the connection that goes all the way back to when the Moors, right? When the Moors, now Moors is from Morocco, right? Moor means black. Why? Because they they were also from Morocco, right? And they were called black Moors. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So, you know, throughout history, uh, the Gentiles try to hide the fact that, uh, you know, Israelites were involved in a lot of things. But what I find interesting is, you know, I don't know how many of you all remember uh, the article. Uh, I think I think Dante was the one who showed that as well, where uh, you had some Israelites. I think it was Dante uh, that was that show Israelites that were poets. Right. And so the, they were talking about how uh, good the Jewish poets were. Right. And so, you know, it sort of reminds you, you know, rappers, right, hip hop, all that kind of stuff. People used to like to listen to them. And uh, so, you know, this go this this ties back, though, to what we're talking about today, about this black 
woman, right? This black woman who was from Morocco, right? And uh, she was a poet, right? And so, uh, look, what I'm sharing today isn't is it written by uh, black folks or Negroes or Hebrew Israelites, right? This is white scholarship, right? That says that uh, this woman, right? I'm gonna tell you her name in a bit. But that she wrote most of what we see uh, in terms of uh, the, the 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 poetry and the plays for Shakespeare, and her name is Amelia Bassano Lanier. I'm gonna share this with you right quick as well. This is a short little TikTok thing, and we'll talk about that in a bit. If the plays of William Shakespeare were actually written by a black Jewish woman called Amelia Bassano Lanier, this is a very revolutionary theory, but it's beginning to make sense. She was, after all, England's first published woman poet. She wrote a book in 1611 called Salve Deus, and she was also mistress to the man in charge of the English theatre. What's more, we've found her signatures on seven of the plays. So they found her signatures on several of the plays. Now, I sort of remind you today, right? We we have our music. Uh, you know, we get signed by the uh, record labels, right? And uh, they make money off of us, right? <laughs> uh, same thing, you know, like the whole beef between uh, Beyonce's new cowboy music. And they saying, well, how come y'all are uh, stealing from us? You know, y'all talk about us stealing from, no, you know cowboy music come from black folks right country music come from black folks but they forgot right <laughs> so you know to me i think it's sort of the same thing that we have uh you know during the time of shakespeare but the interesting thing is that this was tied uh to the black amours right and it was tied to you know she was from morocco we're gonna talk about that and she was you know they they say she was a mistress of um you know, a particular person. Now, you know, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, you know, I mean, we might know that uh, as other things like grapes, right? I'm saying grapes. Y'all know what I mean when I say grapes, uh, because during that time, and you know, we'll see, during that time, they were chasing us, enslaving us, as you, as you heard Dante say, you know, they, they were enslaving us, sending us into captivity. And so, uh, you know, in a older uh, historical presentation that we did, we also talked about uh, the black Jews that were in England, right? We talked about the black Jews that were in England, the black Jews that were in Sweden, the black Jews that were in Ireland. We talked about all these things, right? So all of these things start to come full circle. Now, I'm gonna share with you where my uh, next source is coming from, right? Cause you know that's 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 the next thing, right? You're gonna have them them apologists. You know they're gonna be like, "Well, we need primary sources. We need primary sources." You know, whatever. You know, do your own research. All right. So this is where I'm gonna get one of my uh, information from. It's from the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, right? And it says, "Welcome to the Oxfordian." Right, the annual journal published during the fall by Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, the Oxfordian is a professional publication that features papers providing in-depth coverage of issues of importance to Shakespeare scholars. The Oxfordian welcomes submission of learned essays on three interrelated topics, important literary works of the early modern period in English literature, Shakespeare studies, Shakespeare authorship issues. The Oxfordian was established in 1998 by Stephanie Hopkins Hughes, and she served as its editor for 10 years. Dr. Michael Egan edited the journal from 2009 to 2014. Chris Pinnell was the editor from 2014 to 2017. Gary Goldstein, okay, he's an ish person, right? Gary Goldstein is the current editor. Several articles that first appeared in the Oxfordian have been republished and many more have been cited with approval in mainstream Shakespeare books and journals. So it's been it's been published with approvals from mainstream Shakespeare books and journals. Dax Fordian has been cited as the best American academic journal covering the authorship question by William Niederkorn, formerly of the New York Times. It has also been praised by Stratfordian scholar Stuart Hampton Reeves, 
for its academic rigor. In Shakespeare, beyond a doubt, articles from the most recent volumes. Okay, a password protected. So, so, so you can see this is where uh, one of the articles is coming from, from the Oxfordian, right? Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship. All right. So it says, okay, this is the person we're talking about, Amelia Bassano Lanier. This paper proposes a new approach to attribution study, suggesting the poet Amelia Bassano Lanier, hereafter Amelia, as a new candidate for the primary authorship of Shakespeare's works. Primary authorship, right? Now, this is the debate that's going on. And, uh, you know, as you heard in the other thing, uh, her, her signature was on the stuff. And they make a good case, right, of why it, it was her. They make a good case of why it was her. I'm not going to read this whole document. Uh, I'll put the link out there uh, after I finish reading. But uh, anyway, let me continue. So A.L. Rouse, Stephanie Hopkins Hughes, and Martin Green have already linked her to the so-called dark lady of the sonnets. The new evidence is essentially literary with supporting strands of circumstantial and historical material. The present paper reviews Amelia's biography, her work as a major experimental poet, her literary signatures on the plays, and her access to social networks that match the main areas of knowledge displayed by the playwright. Known today as the first woman in England to publish a book of original poetry. First woman now, first woman of England to publish original poetry. Amelia Bassano was born in 1569 into a family of what secret Jews known as Moranos or Conversos. Now, remember, okay, Morano means they got some color. I'm, I'm, that's the simplified version. And Conversos mean they converted Jews, right, to Christians. Now, as you heard Dante say, that's a Jew. Right, those new Christians, they are Jews. She was a converted Jew living in London. They shared their household with some of their cousins, the Lupos, who had been imprisoned as Moranos under Henry VIII. The patriarch of the family, violinist Ambrose Lupo, who was otherwise known as Ambrosius Dio Malaic, a Latin version of the Sephardic dynasty de Alamalayak was certainly in origin an Iberian Jew. Two of the Bassanos married Venetian women surnamed Nasi, suggesting a possible relationship to the wealthy Sephardic family of that name. Also a member of the Aeneas family, some of whom were reported to practice Jewish religious rituals, worked for one of the Bassanos as a servant. However, to outsiders, the Bassanos probably appeared indistinguishable from ardent Puritans who followed Mosaic law. Brought to London from Venice in 1538. Now, y'all know about the ghettos, right? That was in Italy, right? The Jewish ghettos. I'm, I'm just saying all this stuff, when you do the history, it all comes back full circle. Brought to London from Venice in 1538, 30, 39. The dark skin, who? The dark skin Bassano, some of whom were described in contemporary records as black. So don't, don't tell me she wasn't black. Described in contemporary records as black. And who may have been a been a Moroccan as well as Jewish ancestry. Now, like I showed you in the beginning from Dante's work, right? A lot of the Jews went to Morocco. This Jewish person was described as black. became established as the court recorder troupe. In that capacity, they contributed some of the earliest Elizabethan stage music to the plays and mosque, mosques that were staged at court. But the Bassano's activities were probably not limited to providing stage music at court. When the playhouses were built outside the northern city walls about 200 yards away from their home in Spitalfields, the Bassanos were well positioned to supply them with musical services. So, okay, this woman, she was a Jew. She was a black Jew from where? Morocco. And what did she do? She worked for the court, right? The English court, right? 
and she was a what? Poet. From the age of seven after her father's death, Amelia was brought up in the Willoughby household at their country house in Greenwich and at their mansion in the city of London. She was educated by Countess Susan Bertie, a former handmaiden to one of the highly educated Gray sisters. Bertie's elderly mother, the Duchess of Suffolk, was a proto-feminist known for advocating that women should read the Bible for themselves. Then in the early 1580s, perhaps around the age of 13, Amelia became the teenage mistress of the elderly Henry Carey. Now, like I said, they're going to make it try to look good for themselves, right? She's a teenage mistress of the elderly Henry Carey. Can we say great? Right? Because she was a slave. That's what she was. She was a servant. She was working for them Gentiles out there, them Saxons. Lord Hudson, the Lord Chamberlain, he was the most important man in London's theatrical life and will become the patron of the Lord Chamberlain's men. Before she gave birth to his illegitimate son, Henry, he had her removed from court and married off for the sake of appearances to a first cousin, Alfonso Lanier, in late 1592. So he graped her. Then when she got pregnant, he, so, he, he, he gave her away. By the early 1600s, some of Amelia's closest relatives had become firmly established in the senior positions in the position of technical services, music composition, orchestral directing, performing, and set design. All right. I'm going to stop right there. So you see that she was associated with the plays in the theater. Okay. Let me scroll down here. All right, let me get right down. Here we go. Judaism in Hebrew. However, the most peculiar feature of the plays is the familiarity that their author demonstrates with Judaism and Jewish texts. Such knowledge was extraordinarily rare in Elizabethan, Elizabethan London. After all, Jews could not, what? Legally live in England but she was a black converso Jew from Morocco, right? After all, Jews could not legally live in England at the time, and there were only 200 Moranos, conversos, converted Jews to Christianity, or can we say Catholicism, in the whole country. Surprisingly, the subject has attracted only a handful of investigators. Schoenfield, in a paper published in Shakespeare's survey, argued that a Hebrew source lay beneath the Merchant of Venice. Alan Alamont in Notes and Queries has identified a clear reference to the Mishnah in A Midsummer Night's Dream. David Bosch has found other allusions to the Perky Avad and to the Talmud, which was almost inaccessible to non-Jews. So we see that Shakespeare had stuff in his plays and his writings that non-Jews wouldn't know anything about. Florence Smith has identified a few words of spoken Hebrew in the plays, notably in All's Well That Ends Well. Finally, the playwright also uses the work of Fernando de Rojas, the Morano author of La Celestina. Coming from a Morano Jewish family, Italian Jews spoke Hebrew as their first language. Emilia Bassano is a precise fit for these uses. In addition, both the plays and cell deuce describe Jews using the same unusual metaphor. Drawing on a passage in the Gospel of Matthew, the merchant of Venice refers to the dog Jew and the cursed Jew, which was a common term of Christian insult. But uncommonly, Shylock is described as being a reincarnation of the soul of a wolf whose cursed spirit governed a wolf and whose desires are wolvish, bloody, starved, and ravenous in self do Amelia uses the same odd metaphor referring to Jewish wolves, and he also uses imagery from La Celestina. Conclusion, right? I'm going to put this link in there. 
Self Deuce appears superficially to be a spiritual autobiography, but is really a theological satire. In it, Amelia adopts the role of a priest dis distributing the body at the feast and interpreting scripture, which was tantamount to heresy. Indeed, in some respects, this poem on the passion narrative constitutes a radical rewriting of the sacred gospels and Amelia effectively equates herself with the gospel writers. In terms of the religion of Elizabethan England, this was completely heretical, but quite compatible with the equally heretical parodies of the passion story that appear in plays such as the death of Bottom Paramus. Like many philosophers writing at a time of persecution, the author of the plays used literary techniques to conceal their deeper meanings. Several scholars have already suggested that plays contain an underlying deep structure of esoteric and explosive anti-Christian allegories. Can we say anti-Catholic? Such as those in Dream and the impious, or impious parody of Julius Caesar. This helps explain the remaining critical issue of motivation. Amelia would have had the strongest possible motivation for needing to conceal her authorship of these plays during her lifetime. If they're, if they're hidden, allegorical content and her Murano identity, can we say black, had been discovered, she would unquestionably have been executed. So if they found out that this Negro, right, this black Jewish woman, a Jew, a Hebrew Israelite woman, wrote these plays, she would have been executed. These factors explain the great care that the author took not to be suspected of being a playwright and to use a play broker. So that's like today, well, not today, but let's just say you're doing the you know, 17 and 1800s, right? One of the slaves here in America wrote something, right? And it was a success. She could never take credit for it. Same thing like with all of the inventions during the time of our captivity here in America. A lot of the inventors could not take credit for their inventions. All right. Ben Johnson implies in his diary timber that Mr. Shakespeare gave unblotted fair copies of the scripts to the admiring actors who, in their ignorance, believed them to be his own originals. So presumably did Sir George Buck and others. Yet some were not convinced, and by 1687, theatrical rumors were in circulation among those anciently conversant with the stage that Titus Andronicus, at least, was not originally Mr. Shakespeare's, but was brought by a private author to be acted. The present paper proposes that this private author was Amelia Bassano Lanier, a black Jew. African descent. Oh, let me put that that link out there before I forget. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I gotta. I gotta. I'll do it later. I'll put it in the description afterwards because uh, I have the PDF on here. I'll put it in the description uh, later. All right. So, uh, African descent. Amelia Bassano Lanier, a woman of color of North African descent. Family origins in Morocco. Emilia Bassano's ancestors immigrated from Morocco and Northern Africa. See the Jewish lineage page for the immigration history. Morocco is now and was then a multi-ethnic, multi-racial country. It was mostly black. That fact alone does not shed sufficient light on the question of whether Emilia Bassano was a woman of color. However, by combining that fact with many others, a pattern emerges pointing in that direction. She was probably biracial. Now, they say biracial. What does that mean? Does it mean she was white and black? Not necessarily. No. But you know how Gentiles do. They got to they gotta take a little bit of that melanin out and put a little white in because great people can't have no blackness or can't be fully black, right? She was probably biracial with light brown skin. See, that he making stuff up now because they say she was black. But anyway, and, and she's from Morocco. Well, let, let, let's, let's continue. Facially, she may have resembled the portraits on this page. Some scholars believe one or both may be of her, while others think that may be paintings of other women. 
Based on various clues and deductions, Emilia probably had a darker complexion and hair that was nearly black. Now, stop right there for a second. Didn't he just say right here she would probably buy a racial light skinned brown? Come on now. Come on. Didn't he say that? Then we just go down here. Amelia probably had darker complexion and hair that was nearly black. Come on now. So am I misreading this, fam? Did he just not contradict himself in the same paragraph? Yes or no? Give me a one if he just dis if he contradicted himself. Give me a two if he didn't. But see, they do this stuff all the time. See, this, this is why they, you know, <laughs> this, this is why we have trust issues with them folks, right? Right? They, they, they say they're Christian. They say they're believers. They tell you have truths, right? That this is the problem. And they think we's too stupid. Hey, we not slaves no more. We can read. We're educated. Some of us got masters and PhDs. Some of us lawyers and doctors. Come on now. But that ain't never good enough for them. But let's continue. Unknown appearance. Since there are no verified paintings or images of Amelia Bassano, nobody knows with certainty what she looked like. But he just said she was black, right? <laughs> but nobody knows what she looked like. But she's from Morocco, and they described her as black, and he thought she was mixed. But okay, all right, okay. See, see, this, see, see, they, they can't be black, black, blackity black, black. They can't be black, black. Got to put a little cream in the sugar, now, nah, a little a cream and sugar in the coffee. You know what I'm saying? You can't just have black coffee. You got to put a little cream and sugar in there. The image most often thought to be her is a cameo by Nicholas Hillard in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London displayed below. Until the 1970s, this portrait was thought to be of an unknown woman or possibly Mary Sidney, Countess of Pembroke. So they thought this image here was the Countess of Pembroke. George Bernard Shaw believed it could be Mary Fenton, a maid of honor to Queen Elizabeth. Some speculate that Fenton was the dark lady referred to in the Shakespeare sonnets. Other scholars contend Emily Bassano was the dark lady. So here's the picture. He's saying this. Some people thought that it could have been Emily, but then most other people didn't think it was Emily. It could have been this countess, right? But, but, but you know, we don't really know, but we try to think she might have been white or half white, half black. You know what I'm saying? The closer to white, the better. But we got the history, right? All this stuff lines up. The woman in the miniature could also be Luce Morgan, the abbess of Cleckenwell. So let, why don't he just say you don't know who she is and why even present it? You don't know who she is. Don't present all these other people. Who was considered a black prostitute. Oh, okay. So she could be black if she's a prostitute, right? I, I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying? This is how they do. This is why I got a problem with it. You know, anyway. Still others believe in a picture of Mary Montejoy with whom Shakespeare had an affair while living with her and her husband, Christopher. All we actually know is that Emilia Bassano was one of a number of women who may have posed for it. So they don't know, right? All of that to say he really don't know. We're showing you a picture of a half black, half white woman, or maybe a white woman. We don't know. So, you know, but it could be her. Okay. All right. This is how y'all do. See, anyway. But, you know, you could get a little truth out of them. The painting below called an allegorical painting of two ladies by an unknown English artist is from the UK, Department of, for Digital Culture, Media and Sports, Arts Council, England, and Lord Parkinson of Whitley Bay. The painting is described as an extremely rare depiction of a black female sitting alongside her white companion. Although neither woman is likely to be Emilia Bassano, Lanier, the women are portrayed in, in an equivalent fashion with similar attire jewelry and hairstyle it lends credence to the likelihood that a dark-skinned woman of that era could flourish and socialize in white english society emilia bassano Lanier died in 1645 at the age of 76 so he's saying here look emilia could have been this dark woman but further up he said she could have been a light-skinned black woman she could have been mixed she could have been this white looking woman right here who was a countess. But down here, she could have been this dark uh, African looking Negro, uh, you know, because he's not referring to the white woman. 
So it leads credence to the likelihood that a dark-skinned woman of the era could flourish and socialize in white English society. So in essence, you know, you had black royalty in England which really isn't hard to believe, right? Since we know the history, we know that the Moors ran Europe for what, almost uh, what, 800 years pro approximately, right? Over 800 years. We ruled Europe, which is why they don't like us too much. That's why they hid it for so long. Well, you know, the, the Moors were Muslims. The Moors were Muslims. They don't tell you that the Moors were black Muslims. Until you find something that tell you the truth and they call them the black amours. Well, black don't mean black. It just means her hair color was dark. Black don't mean black. It just means that she was like sad. Y'all know. Y'all have heard it. Black Hebrews. Ooh, they admit that they're black Hebrews. I thought there weren't any black Hebrews. I thought... Isn't that what they told us like over the last, what, umpteen years, six years? Dr. Peter Matthews, who has extensively researched the Bassano family and claims to have forensically analyzed Shakespeare's plays, believes it, believe it, it is almost certain that Emilia wrote many of them. His books and articles are listed on the bi biography page. Matthews theorizes based on information he has uncovered and by making connections between various discoveries that the Bassanos may have been what? Black Hebrews. Can y'all repeat after me, boys and girls? Black Hebrews. Who the Bassanos may be what, family? Repeat after me, family. Come on. All, that, all after me, right? Okay. One, two, three. Black Hebrews. Can y'all say Black Hebrews, family? Black Hebrews. I didn't say it. This, is what, this dude said it. The palm colored guy said it. I didn't say it. He said it. Black Hebrews. He suggests that they may be descended from the blackest Shulamite. Shunem was a biblical village where the Philistines settled prior to fighting the Israelite king Saul, whose army was led by David. Egyptian pharaohs also conquered the village. Today it is called Salem. It is in northern Israel, not far from Nazareth. A cousin called a little black man. Now, now, now watch how they do this, right? This, this is how they play games, right? I, I just find it very funny. In 1584, Emilia's first cousin, Arthur Arturo Bassano, remember they black Hebrews, right, was arrested for a misdemeanor. So, so remember, he just said that they were black Hebrews, right? He said that she was black. They said that she was a, Mor uh, a Moroccan, right? Now, now watch this. Watch how they do. Bassano was arrested for a misdemeanor on Cree Church Lane in London near a secret synagogue. In 1585, Arthur's brother, Mark Anthony Bassano, remember they're black Hebrews, was arrested for offensive comments to soldiers departing for Flanders. In court disposition, John Spencer, the sheriff of London, referred to Arthur as what? A little black man. And to another Bassano brother as a tall black man. Matthews does not believe this refers to their skin. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute, I'm confused. Somebody help me. Somebody help me. So, first of all, they're from Morocco. Secondly, they say she was dark-skinned. Then they said that she was known as being black. Then he said that they were black Hebrews, right? Black Hebrews, the Bassanos. Emilia Bassano was black. They said it, right? Y'all read it with me. I read it. He said it. Then he come to say that her, her, her cousin, who was a Bassano, because remember, they black Hebrews, right? was known as little black man. And the other brother was called a tall black man. But Matthew does not believe this refers to the skin color. Come on now. Somebody make it make sense. Somebody make it make sense. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm a little slow. See, this, this is why you can't trust them. This is why they, you know, we got trust issues. Well, you're using their uh, their information. Well, you know, if it lines up with all the recorded history that we've gathered so far, then yeah. You got to filter through the lies. I'm just saying it don't make no sense to me. Maybe it makes sense to you. His skin color wasn't black, but he was known as a black Hebrew. His skin wa color wasn't black, but she was black skinned. She's from Morocco. She's from Africa. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Then they say she is a black Hebrew. Come on now. I'm sorry. It just don't make no sense. This is stupid. 
This is stupid. See, but they want to critique us. They want us to get primary sources, which we always have. I'm just saying. Oh, well. However, John Hudson, another Bassano research and scholar, believes it does. So, so this guy, he's smart, right? He's smart. He knows, okay, they were known as black, he black Hebrews. She was black. She was from Morocco. So, you know, these other dudes, they, you know, they got some racial issues going on because they got to make a light white, right? Light, bright, and almost white, right? They got to do it, right? But this guy, Hudson, another Bassano researcher and scholar, believes it does refer to black skin. Obviously, it refers to black skin. Obviously, right? Right? Obviously. So he believes it refers to the black skin. Matthews postulates that Bassanos were instead tanned Hebrews. Uh-oh. Now we're playing with the words again. Okay. So he believes it refers to skin. They were called little black men, called a tall black man. But Bassano, but Matthews postulates that Bassanos were instead tanned Hebrews. Oh, oh, my goodness. This is racism for you. The only agreement seems to be that there was some shade of light brown. <laughs> I'm sorry, family. I can't. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> so he, was, he was called a little black man, a little tall black man. Amelia Masada was known as black. They were known as black Hebrews, but Matthews believed they were tan Hebrews. <laughs> like brown. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is foolishness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Dark skinned characters in plays. Supplementing the research and pattern of circumstantial evidence offered on this website and discussed elsewhere, as in the publication cited on the bi bibliography page, are indirect hints and clues that Emilia Bassano or another person of color penned many of the plays attributed to Shakespeare. That's what they said in the other article I read, right? No other Elizabethan era playwright portrayed as many dark skinned characters, some clearly of African descent. So now they got these characters of African descent. Amelia Bassano was known as a black Hebrew from Morocco, but she was tanned and light skinned. But, but now they're writing about Africans and stuff, right? Although the plays credited to Shakespeare were not the first, the first and only one I've identified was the Battle of Alakazar, written a few years earlier prior to 1591 by George Peel. The play is set in Morocco and depicts black Moroccans in dramatic roles, including leadership positions. I think some somebody got to go back to school because he contradicts himself so many times in the same paragraphs. Moorish characters. None of the Shakespearean plays are set in Morocco, but several include well-developed Moorish characters and other people of color in key roles. Interestingly, none of them are slaves. This is remarkable since the English of the time in general viewed blacks unfavorably and possessed condescending attitudes toward them. Although British ships were engaged in the slave trade and began bringing slaves to England in 1555, Africans who settled in England after 1569 were treated as free even in former slaves elsewhere. Fit with Emily, Emilia's ethnicity. Emilia, whose ancestry traces back to Morocco, can we say Africa? Can we say Africa, boys and girls? Was probably a descendant of Berber Jews. Now, we know initially Berbers were blacks, black Africans. We've talked about that before. Berbers were known back then as black Africans, not the light-skinned mixed people from, you know, the Turkish descent. We know that. We could prove that here, right? We, we looked at the black codes and stuff, right? And some of the laws in America where the only people who could be slaves were Negroes and Berbers. I'm just saying. 
So Berber Jews and would be naturally predisposed to depict more than other dark-skinned people in important capacities, especially in ways that defy stereotypes. She could draw on her own life experience. A white English playwright would be far less able to do so, but then he says she was light-skinned. But now he says she's African. And she portrayed dark-skinned people. She was a Moor. She was a Berber. A Berber Jew. That means she was a Negro. She was a black Jew. See, what I'm what I said uh in the past, and we, you know, we've been through the study, you know, all the historical uh stuff we did in the past, you know, we talk about the Berbers, we talk about they were black African, we talk about all this stuff. See, this is when you do good scholarship. When you do good scholarship, things start to make sense. History starts to line up and confirm and validate one another. Berber Jews, while Bassano's ancestors, but not with that surname, may have lived in Shunem, at some point the family migrated to Morocco and lived there for perhaps centuries. They may have intermarried with Africans and become part of the Berber Jewish community. Berber Jews had both light and dark complexions. I mean, well, that's how Negroes are. Light and black complexions from light, light to brown to blackety black, black. Emilia's forebears, including her grandfather, moved to Spain in the 1300s, then to the Venetian Republic during the Spanish Inquisition around 1492. Between 1531 and 1539, several of her uncles and her father immigrated to England. In Venice and England, they may have been called Blackamoors. Why are they called Blackamoors? Because they black. Blackly black, black. A disparaging term for black Muslims. So now, you know, hey, all Moors were not Muslims because they just said they were Berber Jews, right? But they were known as black Moors. Why? Because they lived in Morocco. Moors are black folks from Morocco. So therefore, they were black Jews or Berber Jews. Now, they say disparaging term for black Muslims. It wasn't just black Muslims. They like to do that. No, no. It was black folks. This was a misnomer. Although their ancestry could be traced back to Morocco and they were darker skinned than the native population. He, he, he contradicts himself all the time. They were not Muslim. Okay, why? Because they were black Jews. Emilia's mother, thought to be Margaret Johnson, was a Caucasian English woman. Do we know that? <clears throat> I mean, maybe her mom was black. I don't know. I mean, I'm sorry. Maybe her mom was white and she was black. I don't know. You know, hey, there's some mixing sometimes. I don't know that. We don't know if, if, if the mom was an English Caucasian. We don't know that. And, uh, you know, Dante's video mentioned ancient Jews were black. Right? And that the ancient Berbers were black. Morocco and Mali. Part of Morocco make up the ancient Morocco. Black folks. I'm like, look, when you start doing the history, you can't hide it no more. When you really dig deep, you can't hide it no more. The truth comes out. I told you, just like with prophecy and anything else and study and research, and you know, all you got to do is wait. All you got to do is wait, kick up your feet and wait, oh, you know, do your research, do, you know, start digging in. All you got to do is wait. Six Shakespearean plays with characters of color. Four of the six plays portray Moors, which seems more than a coincidence given Amelia's family history. Titus Andronicus, Aaron, Tamaris, Moorish lover. Othello, we know Othello was a Negro, right? Othello, a Moorish military leader referred to as a blackamoor because she's from Morocco and she wrote the histories, she wrote the plays, you know, all that stuff. The Merchant of Venice, Prince of Morocco, Anthony and Cleopatra. The play includes several Moors Cleopatra described as tawny. Can we say black? Can we say brown? They'd call me Tony I'm, or they'll call me Red. Two other plays include women of color. The Taming of the Shrew. Kate Catherine the Shrew is described as dark-skinned. She dark-skinned. Can we say black? 
perhaps like Amelia saw herself the revealing lines. Kate, like the hazel twig, is straight and slender and as brown in hue as hazelnuts and sweeter than the kernels. But they're going to say that don't mean that, right? Love's labor law say character's lover is described as black as ebony and she born to make black fair. So y'all think a white guy named Shakespeare wrote them plays? Nah, I don't think so. It was another Hebrew Israelite woman. Always stealing our stuff. Why? Because we blessed like that. We blessed like that. We might have went into captivity, but God's for the Yah's gifts, he don't take them back. Whatever he gives you, he gives you. Whatever he bless you with, he bless you with. Skills-wise, talent-wise. Beyond Shakespeare's experience and knowledge, what would incline Shakespeare who had limited who had a limited education and was from a small town where he had probably never met any people of color to populate several of his plays with Africans in prominent roles. There's nothing in his background or known adult experience to suggest he would be so inclined or even that he had an awareness of their lives so he could portray them. So he couldn't portray no Negroes, no Africans, no Moorish people, right? Because he ain't never been around them. Didn't know anything about Moors. Didn't know anything to be able to make Othello, Othello a black a Moor. Another curiosity, a curious facet, and somewhat of a side note, is that one of the most frequently played musical pieces accompanying performances of Shakespeare's plays was King Kafutu, Kafetua, and the Beggar Maid. It's a ballad about an African king and his love for the beggar Penelophon. Of all the music that could have been chosen, why this one? Many English and European compositions could have been selected and they likely would be music far more familiar to Shakespeare and English musicians. So how did King Kefetua and the beggar maid get into the mix? Central question. Was Emilia Bassano Lanier dark-skinned? In comparison to the light-skinned English, there is general agreement that she was. How dark and how she actually saw herself is an open question. Was she biracial? No, I don't believe she was biracial. Taken as a whole, this constellation of facts, research, and script clues in the form of major dark-skinned characters in the plays strongly suggests that she was what? A Negro, a Hebrew, a Black Jew, a Berber Jew, a black Hebrew Israelite, like y'all like to call us, a black Hebrew Israelite. I didn't write none of this. This your people, your palm colored folks. Y'all wrote this. Y'all say she black. Y'all say she black and more. Y'all say she probably wrote the Shakespeare plays. You can't. You can't accuse us of it. You can't say we took it out of context. I read it to well, you know, you're cool, but that's that's um that's uh you know uh you 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 didn't understand what you read. He 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 just meant that you know uh uh she was she was sort of like black uh uh you know but as you saw she she had uh she was light skinned. So Israel <laughs> continues to be the ones who created society. Israel continued to be the ones who wrote the plays. Israel continued to be the ones who do all the great things in society. Can we say Michael Jackson? Can we say all of the black inventors in America? Can we say all of the rappers and hip hop? Can we say all of the best football players, basketball players, and you know it, anything we do, we excel at, unless they shut us down. I know, I know. I'm a little bit more aggressive in my historical presentation, but you know, that's me. Because the truth has to come out. I told you, this is a truth ministry and this is what we're about. Bringing out the truth. Why? Because you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I'm ready to be free. And hopefully based upon that prophecy that the, the young 11-year-old 
gave that I read in the beginning, right? Hopefully he'll be the one, you know, be the one whose dreams come true, right? And hopefully that exodus is near and hopefully we get out of here soon because guess what? They hate us with a passion. Psalm 83 is real, run by Esau. Oh, yeah. And, you know, some of the books admit that Esau is Caucasian or white. Which makes sense to me because, you know, it also tied back to Rome, like I said, to Zephyr. Which also tied to why Herod was uh, put over the authority of a black nation called Israel or in a city, a black city in Jerusalem run by black folks. I love it when history comes together. I love when it starts to make sense. And everything that we all have been teaching Line upon line, precept upon precept, right? It all starts to come together and paint a picture. I love it. Peace and blessings, Israel. Your captivity is ending. Love you with the love of Messiah. If you want to support this ministry, you can by becoming a patron. Also, Cash App, dollar sign T O T W 7101. Dollar sign T O T W 7101. And also, please make sure to support our Dry Bones project. And also, make sure to pray. Oh, and before I continue, continue, give me a like. If you like this presentation, give me a like. We haven't done a historical thing in a while. <clears throat> so give me a like, share this video. Uh, you know, I think in, in, in uh, the not too distant future, it's going to be obvious, you know, because, you know, the truth goes through phases, <laughs> vehemently opposed, right? then recognize and then then it's like uh it was always the case right and i'm just paraphrasing that but that's how history is and that's how truth is right you get opposition and then it's like well we always said that we always knew the jews were black watch you're gonna hear that right we always knew the jews were black uh, how did how did you not know the jews were weren't black how y'all didn't know y'all were the jews right that, that's gonna be the next thing peace and blessings israel love y'all peace out <laughs>